Welcome to this last episode of the SciLife Lab talk show. My name is Lisa Kirsebom and I am a science journalist and it's been my great pleasure to be your guide through these four programs. Uh, telling you some of the very varied work that SciLife Lab is doing today and will be doing tomorrow. Today's theme is community collaborations and I have with me three guests. Um, Cecilia Williams, professor at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and Richard Rosenqvist Brandel, professor at Karolinska Institute and director of Genomic Medicine Sweden, and Stefan Bertilsson, professor at SLU, visiting professor at Uppsala University, and coordinator of AMRI, the Aquatic Microbiome Research Initiative. Welcome, all of you. Um, Cecilia, why don't you start? I know you normally do cancer research, but recently you've been studying wastewater. Why is that? And uh, what have you found? Yes, uh, it's quite a change. Uh, normally I work with cancer research at SciLife Lab in Solna. But uh, when the pandemic hit, I was part of being in a regular committee for collaboration between KTH and the region Stockholm, including healthcare. And there it came up that uh, they needed help with testing to test without doing a step that's called RNA extraction. Uh, and then we started to set that up in my lab. Uh, and we always, we work a lot with this technology that's used called qPCR. So that was not uh, strange. And then um, my colleague at KTH, Zeynep Chetetugurul, uh, she was initiating wastewater testing which I had also heard about that they had started in the Netherlands and thought that we, uh, when she asked me, I thought it would be a great idea to do that in Stockholm as well. And since the technology is the same for testing of the virus that we had already set up in the lab as in the wastewater, except that it's uh, a lot less virus in the wastewater, so you need to optimize it. Uh, and that's something I have experienced from my PhD. And that's how I got into it, testing wastewater. Um I see. Um, uh, what have you found? Just briefly, we can go into that more later, maybe. But yes, uh, we found uh, quite quickly. We found that there was uh, significant levels of the virus in the wastewater, and we started this back in uh, April, and we saw high levels in April and May. But then uh, the levels decreased a lot, and in the summer they were so low that we could no longer detect it with uh, the technology we use, uh, and this correlated well with the cases that we knew of people having the virus in Stockholm. But then when we came back after the summer, we had to wait for some reagents and then we started the testing again. And then we saw that already from mid-August, uh, we could see rapidly increasing levels of the virus. Uh, so we, uh, we thought that was uh, of interest and concern to be notified, uh, uh, raised some alarm about that. And I think that helped to maybe raise the awareness of the peak in pandemic we are in the middle of right now. Right. Uh, right. Um, Stefan, uh, Amri, that's one of SciLife Lab's research community programs. Would you tell us something about what that means and what you do in the program? Yes. So, so these research community programs, they really, uh, they, they, they originate from SciLife Lab investment in uh, projects to enhance or promote really scientific research ne networks that are existing and that are strong and that could uh, that basically work in the area of the or relevant for Sinai Club. And in this, this case, for our research community program, it's about aquatic microbiology, so microorganisms that are residing in water. Um, in lakes, in oceans, but also in groundwater and in uh, technical systems such as the wastewater uh, systems that Cecilia is studying. Um, and indeed, several of our members in the community network are also involved in similar or related projects. All right. Um, Rickard, uh, Genomic Medicine Sweden, I know, has its roots in the SciLife Lab diagnostics development platform. Won't you tell us a little bit how that connects and, and also what GMS is right now? Yes, so actually already 2012-13, we started to discuss with SciLife how can we move 
the uh, fantastic technologies that are developed by Silaf Lab into healthcare and, and use them uh, within Swedish healthcare. And, and then we, we decided to start uh, uh, specific units, clinical genomics, uh, first in, in Stockholm and Uppsala, which really worked between Silaf Lab and uh, the hospital in order to adapt technologies for, for translational for clinical trials and also for clinical um, uh, usage. And after a few years, uh, we started uh, facilities also in Lund and Gothenburg. And then we thought, why not uh, engage the whole country and st start a national initiative on genomic medicine. So in 2017, we got a, a planning grant from, from SWELIFE in order to, um, to plan for the infrastructure um, and pilot diagnosis, etc. And then we started off 2018 with, with the genomic medicine uh, Sweden infrastructure. And uh, uh, Silaflam has been really instrumental in, in this process. And as you say, it was sort of, it has its roots in Silaf Lab and we want to continue this. So what we do in, in genomic medicine in Sweden is that we, we use new high throughput sequencing technologies in healthcare in order to deliver uh, refined, improved diagnostics or precision diagnostics. And this is used in order to to be able to deliver precision medicine, that is to get a, a patient adapted treatment or, or care. So the, some of the focus areas that we work uh, a lot with is, is rare diseases and, and cancer, for instance, but also microbiology and, and other disease areas. Mm -hmm. Stefan, um, will you tell us something about what you have uh, achieved in Amri so far and what the connection to Silaf Lab uh, meant to that? Okay, so to start with, um, aquatic microbiology is a pretty established and strong research area in Sweden. We have many leading groups working on these kind of topics. So we had a really mature research community to build from. But with, with this research community program, we were able to bring these, um, all these groups together. And essentially, and what was really important to bring people working on, on marine systems and oceans together with people working on inland waters and people working on technical systems. So what we have been able to do, and, and of course, plans have been somewhat disrupted by the COVID-19 situation, but, but the, the idea had been to, to, to bring this added value by, um, by connecting different research groups to ex increase exchanges uh, to organize joint training, to have scientific meetings, to have everybody come together and exchange ideas and, and um, information. And we've done that. We've had all hands meetings. We have had research exchanges where we send students, for example, from one lab to another for researchers. Um, we have organized back-to-back uh, -back meetings with other happenings in, in the research uh, landscape here, like the Crawford days that uh, were organized last year. Um, and we have also, particularly now with the current situation, we're organizing bi-weekly um, scientific talks virtually over the internet. And, and we are also working a lot with, with bringing information and sharing information in the entire community when it comes to opportunities, uh, conferences, interesting online content and other things uh, via websites and, and so on. So we're trying to build this community and, and really have the people work together to initiate new projects and to join forces to solve important environmental problems. Right. Thanks. Uh, Cecilia, you already talked a bit about the results of the wastewater study, but uh, will you tell us also something about what it meant to be attached to SciLife Lab when it comes to that project particularly? Yeah, I think that was uh, fundamental, um, both because of the community that's already here that immediately started to exchange uh, knowledge and, uh, and information uh, through Slack channels and others. And then when Silat Lab distributed some funding from the Knutten Alice Wallenberg, uh, that was uh, critical for us to be able to get started. And their idea of also putting together 
different groups that worked in the same area was crucial for all of us to get a head start so we could quickly collaborate and get input and ideas and start right away. So I think without that, it would we would not have gotten to a working situation. Mm-hmm. If I ask you to try to look ahead five years, um, what possible collaborations or cooperations could you see that could be attached to SciLife Lab that where that could be a support or a core, just like it has been here for you? Yeah, I, I think this is uh, quite revolutionary to when you focus on research to put together these groups that have common interest and make them collaborate or present it so that it's very easy to start collaborating. Uh, I think that can be applied in many different areas. And I think that concept is really good. And also to utilize the whole community that is uh, engaged in SciLife Lab. It makes it very quick and easy to, to, to work efficiently. Thank you. Stefan, same to you. What possibilities do you see in a five-year perspective? I think that one of the main motivations for creating this um, is, is, is both to, to for, for us at least, to give environmental sciences sort of a role and a voice in SciLife Lab. And I hope that we all will be able to fulfill that kind of expectation. Because I think we're a very we're a mature research community and we use and interact with SciLife Lab, Lab a lot in terms of their technology um, offer. So I think that we could be a, a, a good uh, group to, to interact with there in terms of informing or, or requesting certain services or certain technologies that we can then reach more broadly the, the life sciences research community in Sweden, perhaps beyond medicine and also bridging into the environmental sciences. I think that's a very important role for us. And that is a role I think we can, we can maintain long term. Um, as you have the, the network together. I also think it's important that we create some this extra visibility for this research uh, field, both nationally, but also internationally to further strengthen the, the, the leading position that we actually have in this field internationally to build, kind of build a vibrant research community. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you. Richard. Where will GMS be in five years, or will there be something else than GMS? I th- I hope that GMS is still there in, in five years. We we have just uh, uh, written our strategy plan, uh, ten year strategy plan. Um, so I would say that of course genomics is the first level, but of course we know that there are many omics level that that are also relevant, like proteomics, metabolomics, etc that is very relevant for, for precision medicine. And I, that's why we think it's so important for GMS to keep close to SciLab Lab because a lot of the new technologies are coming uh, through SciLab Lab and, and then we can help uh, uh, to implement in them in, in healthcare large scale. So I think that we will have a continued uh, fruitful collaboration in particular now also when we have this data-driven life science effort where one of the areas uh, is precision medicine and diagnostic development here i see that we can have a lot uh, to collaborate uh, between gms and side lab thank you very much and thanks to all of you for being here today thanks Rickard, stefan and cecilia There are more than a thousand researchers and staff scientists connected to SciLife Lab, and millions are affected by the work you do.
Our next three guests are all fairly early in their career. We have asked them to join the show to tell us what being tied to SciLife Lab means to them at this position in life. I have with me Alba Korman, currently doing her last year as a PhD at Karolinska Institutet and previously on the SciLife Lab PhD Council. Alexandra Tilecki, a researcher at Uppsala University and a SciLife Lab Fellow, and Paul Hudson, a researcher at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology with his group located at the SciLife Lab Solna campus and also a SciLife Lab Fellow. Welcome all of you. Um, Alba, why don't you go first? Tell us what your PhD project is about. Well, uh, my PhD project is about finding uh, small molecules or drugs that um, we can use for understanding biology, but also as potential new therapies for diverse diseases. Uh, we have a screen during my PhD for uh, compounds able to alleviate the effects uh, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. I don't know if you remember the ice bucket challenge. I do, yes. <laughs> And then um, also to understand like fundamental biology, like how proteins are produced in the, in the cell and how we can change that because it can be beneficial for diseases such as, such as cancer, for instance. And yeah, basically that. Yeah, interesting. Will you also say something brief about the PhD council? Uh, again, you're not on it anymore, but you were. What, what did that mean to you? Well, I mean, we started the PhD Council as a group of friends that we just wanted to do things in-house because we found that um, we needed to connect more what was going on inside the lab and we were curious about what was the research that was being done here. So we started to organize things like seminars and then we organized um, a mini symposium and we got like a lot of help from from the fellows and different project leaders and also the administrations of SciLife Lab to do that. So it was a way of uh, building up a community of PhD students and uh, because it's very important when you are like growing in, in, into academia to have like support and also like to be inspired by other researchers that you have around and to build contacts and networks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alexandra, uh, tell us about your research. Yeah, thank you. We are working in pharmaceutical nanotechnology, so we are actually material scientists and we want to use uh, the unique properties of very, very small uh, materials, nanoparticles, and to use them to develop um, new, for example, diagnostic uh, devices in medicine, but also advanced uh, drug delivery systems to improve uh, treatment. So we are especially focusing on diseases in the gastrointestinal tract, like inflammatory bowel disease that is affecting millions of people worldwide. And we are using magnetic nanoparticles to use them as imaging agents so that it can be very easy for the patients to be diagnosed with, with this disease. Interesting. Thank you. Paul, um, what does your group do? Yeah, thank you. Um, our group works in biosustainability. And uh, in particular, we're working on novel bioproduction systems. And that's a fancy way for me to say we're trying to build little cell factories, uh, little cell factories that can produce biofuels or novel chemicals. And novel in that we look at bacteria that takes carbon dioxide in particular, so bacteria that can take carbon dioxide and convert that into something useful uh, for society. And this involves the what we call metabolic engineering. So studying the metabolism of the cells, genetically engineering the cells so their metabolism is altered uh, and hoping we can, uh, we can convince them to produce something uh, useful. Yeah, very cool. Tell me, um, what has being connected to SciLife Lab meant to you and your research? For me, uh, being connected to SciLife Lab has, uh, it's meant that my research has expanded quite a bit. So uh, the focus of SciLife Lab, sort of high throughput molecular biology, this is not typically associated with our type of work. Uh, so that's typically more industrial biotechnology. But for me, being connected to SciLife Lab, the most important thing is that it's exposed us to new, new technology, to put it frankly. And these are technologies like next generation sequencing, 
quantitative proteomics, microfluidics. I mean, state-of-the-art technology that we now have access to and people to collaborate with to help us learn these technologies. And it's allowed us to answer questions about bacterial metabolism that I don't think would have been possible without. Uh, and that selfishly, it's also allowed me to sort of separate myself in the field. So, so carve out a niche for myself uh, as a sort of, you, you know, taking a unique angle in this field of biosustainability. So these types of things are not typically associated with biosustainability, but uh, they can be. Right. Alexandra, what about you? What does it mean for you to be connected to SciLife Lab? For me, I mean, as I mentioned, we come from, from an engineering perspective, working as, as material engineers and uh, in, within SciLife Lab has really helped us to, to talk with, with medical scientists and also get closer to the clinics in order to identify the needs there and to then really develop the nanotechnology towards, towards real applications, towards what is needed in the clinics. And this wouldn't be possible if, if we wouldn't be located in, in this, this type of community. And of course, also supported by the infrastructure of, uh, of SciLife Lab that gives us access to state-of-the-art uh, imaging techniques, for example, like MRI, or also uh, biomarker discovery, like, uh, like proteomics. So we are really, um, I guess a bit like Paul said, also expanding our research into areas which I, I don't think we would have been in otherwise. Right. Alba, what about you? What does the connection for Sil to SciLife Lab mean to you? Well, um, in our research, uh, we are provided with the compound libraries by the uh, Chemical Biology Consortium in, in Sweden, and uh, they are based there. And also, uh, we are a phenotypic screening lab. So we are working in this kind of high throughput manner that Paul was referring to and it's the perfect scenario to get like all this high throughput expertise and more a little bit industrial way but also keeping the academia background and to evolve into that and besides that as a student like the expertise of having like very different backgrounds and listen to very different ideas and also uh, establish like new collaborations or, or think differently, basically. Uh, now, um, being at this part of your career, early on, first steps of a long path, that, that is often a little bit special, I know that. So tell us something about um, both what inspires you and what is interesting, but also if there are challenges that are special for this. Uh, yes, I mean, what inspires me is curiosity. I, I think so you have a question and you want to answer it and you design an experiment to answer it and that is already like a very uh, driving force because you want to know and if it doesn't work then you want to know why and also like how can I change my model into to, to understand it better or to make it work uh, so I think that that's my main driving force also I am a very project kind of person so it's like I start something I want to finish it and then uh, also communicate our research because that's really really important um, so that's the, the driving force also working with people because it's kind of cool like you manage to get like different ideas from other people and you try to give your input and then of the challenge of the challenges that things sometimes don't work um, and you have to get used to that then uh, we have like a lot of pressure into uh, publishing and so on but it's not like the worst thing on, on earth I mean uh, you know we are not like in war or something but uh, yeah there is a lot of pressure and, um, and uh, sometimes as a PhD student uh, well I'm very happy because I have like a really nice environment but there is people that they don't have like the best environment and uh, sometimes you need like other PhD students that they are um, going through the same thing together there will be always parallelisms and they are going to understand you more than people that is not into science like why are you going into uh, like in the weekend to do this experiment I mean your friends that are not in science they may not understand but then your other friends that are into science they may so yeah. Alexandra, what about you, inspirations and challenges? Yeah, I think inspirations is definitely the, the possibility to pr pursue your ideas and uh, to build a team around it and, and you know, just 
go for it, try and try it out. Of course, also coupled with the disappointment that not everything, everything works, but just to be, yeah, kind of your, your own, yeah, your own boss, so to say, you can decide. And if you find something interesting, you can just, just go for it. And also I, I'm also really inspired by the continuous learning, which is, uh, yeah, it's been a really steep learning curve for me, uh, interacting with, with medical scientists, biologists that talk a, a completely different uh, language than engineering people. So this is, uh, but that keeps you going. You also learn and stimulate and, and generate uh, new research ideas. So yeah, that's been, uh, but of, yeah, it, it's always a challenge, of course, to get everything going and being so successful, being such at the, at the early stage of the career. Of course. Paul, what do you say? Yeah, I, I think uh, Alexandra and Alba, they have a really good point to agree with. One of them uh, is certainly this idea that if you have an idea, just go for it. And it, it, seems, uh, it seems quite simple to say that, but it, it means a lot uh, for scientists to be able to do that and to have a career where you can just do that. I mean, you can lay in bed at night and think of an idea and then say, why not? I can, I can do this. There's not, it's just myself to, to get going. So that's a huge inspiration stimulation um also i think it's the problem that we work on i'm very interested of course in biosustainability and i think that it's a it's a tricky problem uh, that's maybe a difficult solution but it keeps me going because I, i think that we can get there so an intellectual curiosity is there but i also want to point out that i'm stimulated also in sci life lab because the people there are just, uh, they're incredible, I think. Uh, you have people that are extremely passionate and they can they get you if you have a sort of obsession over a problem, like Alba mentioned, they understand that. They have their obsessions as well. Uh, and I've just been exposed to a lot of smart people, PhD students, I'm, I, I'm actually part of, uh, I was associated with this PhD council because there's a, there's a master's program at SciLife Lab that kind of recruits master's students to work there. And I, I've in, I'm involved in that. And I've just been able to meet lots of young people and they're always enthusiastic. So even though I, I get down on my own projects sometimes, it's like there are students when you talk to them, they're extremely enthusiastic about your work. So that, that picks you up. Uh, briefly, I would just say one, one challenge. Uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, when you're, when you're early in your career, it can happen that everything is possible, which is also a challenge actually. So it's almost like you have to be a bit strategic sometimes if you have the whole buffet to choose from, uh, you know, don't fill up on rice at the beginning, you know, choosing your, uh, your strategy uh, when it comes to research, that, that's actually a challenge when you, when you have all the, all the stuff that's available, like at SciLife, for example. Right. Finally, um, what would you say is the most important thing, if you could just think of something briefly, the most important thing that something like the SciLife lab community can do for a researcher trying to get a career going? Yeah, well, for, for me, it was being a SciLife fellow that, of course, is, comes with uh, financial support for, for, for building a group. Uh, but also, I think that the, it's just facilitating exposure for you to other people that are at SciLife Lab and, and, and other technologies that are out there. And, and that sparks an idea. And sometimes, you know, one of your ideas can take you on a route that becomes your, your thing. And, and that, that's what happened to me. And, and I think it's because I was exposed to these other fellows who think differently. They have different expertise. But... That was what SciLife did for me. Right, thank you. Alba, same to you. What can a community do for a researcher early in the career? Mm, I guess that uh, supporting us and seeing like, you know, if we are starting with an initiative like the PhD Council, how can we help you to make it better? Or if I have this doubt about this technique, I mean, what can I do for you? Because they have developed so many things. So, for example, from the um, PhD Council, I mean, we got like a lot, a lot of support from the from the very first beginning. And this has helped people that they don't want to continue into science so much. They want to do like more science communication and things like that to build up their their CVs, basically. So it's not my case, but I mean, I know some friends that, that they do. So it's important. too. Yeah, absolutely. Alexandra, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the financial support is is amazing. It it really gives you a, a kickstart to to start working on your dreams, and then that combined with with the very unique network, um, the the very bright people uh, from different disciplines that really enrich you. And also, 
other fellows that are a bit further in the program than myself, for example, that can share their experiences and, and learnings and are very open to, to discussions and support and collaborations. And I think also the, the SciLife Lab network as large. So for example, um, they were supporting one of our symposiums that we organized or also reaching out to other networks like the, like the Wallenberg Molecular uh, Medicine Fellows. So it really, it really enriches you and yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks all three of you for joining us here today. Thanks to Alexandra and Alba and Paul. Again, it's time to make a trip we are going to SciLife Lab in Umeå. The best thing working at this facility is, um, it's hard to show us one of the things that are best because there's so many things that are fun to do. So, but I think um, one of the things is it's a big variety of different tasks and it's also very developing. We learn new things all the time. And then the range of different scientific projects we see. We see different projects from all over the country every single day. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, projects for cell biology, structural biology, material science. So, and we meet a lot of different, I mean, we meet a lot of people and also see a lot of different research projects. This is very interesting. And we're a great team as well. Yes, a very great team. <laughs> And we're very, so we're very fortunate today at our facility to have world-class instrumentation made with the best uh, microscopes money can buy. And there are only a few of these microscopes available in all of Scandinavia. And this really enables our associated researchers to really pursue frontline research projects, things they can only do using the facilities we have uh, available here. What's really good about being at SciLife Lab facility is the consistency that we have long-term funding, and also we get to, to help on these national, on a national basis, assist researchers from all over the country, not, not just local users here in Newmail, but we get to really help everyone. Yeah. And also being part of the SciLife Lab community with all the other SciLife Lab facilities and the interactions we have together with them. That's really fantastic. Yeah. So I think it's, it's fascinating to, to see uh, that we can help researchers uh, all the way from from having in their they having an idea of, of a biological system that they want to affect then we can help them to both develop an, an assay that that they can use for, to study this and and that can be compatible with with small molecule screening and that involves then that it has to be robust and it has to be able to be performed on, on several thousands of, of small molecules The use of small molecules in research has many advantages uh, if you compare it to, for example, introducing genetic mutants. Uh, with small molecules, you can decide if you want to have a reversible or irreversible effect in your cells. You can also fine-tune the system with the dose of the molecule. You can target essential products that are hard to, to study due to lethality of knockout mutants. Uh, and you can also add functional groups to the molecule and then you create yet another useful tool that you can work with. Well, being a SciLife Lab facility really helps us to reach out to the researchers in Sweden or it shows the researchers that we are a good facility, we have the expertise, we have the techniques and we have the possibility to contribute with a lot of things that uh, could benefit for them in their research. One of the best things with being a SciLife Lab facility is really the, the, that you get in contact with all these other infrastructures and that you can find joint capabilities and, and uh, develop uh, things on a, on a level that would otherwise have been very hard. In Umeå, the NMR facility is part of the national platform with, with SciLife Lab in Gothenburg. We do uh, a lot of different things. Uh, NMR is very versatile and you can get uh, information down to atomic level in the end. A uh, thing that's common in Gothenburg is that we do quite a lot of um, metabolomics, uh, 
we do metabolomics both in liquids, but in humor we can also do it in tissue, tissue metabolomics. Together with Gothenburg, we have the, the strongest magnets and strongest facilities for NMR in, in the Nordic countries, you could say. It's a very good setup, but changes is coming. I think the, the biggest thing happening in NMR right now is in solid state. Uh, we can look at bigger and bigger samples and uh, do uh, technically something called proton detection on solid state NMR. We will get this to Umeå this late autumn. Uh, that will be very fascinating. We aim to help everyone. That's the, the main aim. So we, we don't do a selection which one is worthy and not worthy. So we try to help everyone. We also aim to become not a black box service. Basically, every customer should have full insight in what we're doing and we aim to help them get in further. We can also educate our customers. So it's not like they don't just send us the samples to uh, send the samples to us and we analyze them. We also try to help them uh, getting closer to answer their research questions. And we try to educate them as we go by. The, the good thing with metabolites is that they are the same in every uh, org organism, uh, more or less. So uh, a glucose from an Arabidopsis sample is the same molecule as it is in a human sample. And that opened up to not only work with human uh, materials, we work with everything from algae to, uh, to plasma and liver samples and uh, mouse samples. And, and that yeah, I think is a good way of helping a lot of people. So I, I think it's really fascinating that we have so many different customers for so many different uh, areas of research. It's uh, everything from environmental chemists to physicians and from the hospital and doing uh, analysis that help them forward in their uh, research. Every customer that contacts us is more or less state of the art in their own research field. So we get an insight is on what will happen, in, uh, what future, what future research will be like, like from a year from now or two years from now, we're already on par with what is ongoing. And it's not just one research field, it's quite many fields. We have in the, in the plant kingdom, we have in the animal kingdom, we have all areas. Uh, I think, I think it, to be a Sci Life Lab facility also, uh, it opens up uh, for more customers. Since we, start, since we got the, to be a facility within Sci Life Lab, I think the, the customers from the Stockholm region has increased uh, quite dramatically and it gives us another uh, possibility to show what we can do and uh, to reach out to more uh, researchers in Sweden and also to some extent abroad. We are approaching the end of the SciLife Lab talk show. All that remains for me, really, is to thank you all for the great work that you do and hand over to SciLife Lab director Oli Kaljoniemi. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and, and sort of a thank you, Lisa, for such a professional and wonderful moderation of all of these uh, sessions, as well as the FOSS works for, for uh, doing the production here. So let me do a little bit of an uh, update on, on kind of a since the last episode mode, because so many things have happened at SciLife Lab, also regarding these things that we just talked about. So, so since the uh, 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 DDLS, the Data Driven Life Science activity, we've had a new steering group be nominated, and we are uh, planning now intensively on how to start recruiting new, new uh, PIs and new group leaders to this data-driven life science and working really with all the universities across Sweden to make this uh, program run. And then to jump to the next episode, I mean the COVID-19 uh, program, as you may have heard and you should have heard, we have a new call for uh, research support available from, from the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation to continue the excellent research program that you heard about. And that was so uh, wonderfully described by, by many of the participants in the program. We also have a new element of the program, which is a vaccination research program, as 
we will have the vaccination for COVID-19 soon starting. And uh, also are considering something uh, that relates to the future as to how should we really prepare for future pandemics? Be there is something else than COVID or even the new waves of, of uh, COVID-19. So uh, stay tuned for those and look at our website for the, for the uh, grant funding opportunities. Then on uh, some other funds, I mean, we uh, on, on other uh, fronts, we have like several new SciLab Lab fellows uh, just starting. And I really want to welcome all the newcomers, both the fellows as well as all the students and all uh, infrastructure staff that have recently joined SciLab Lab. And uh, when it comes to the fellows, this is like the second generation of SciLab Lab fellows that, that are almost fully now recruited and we look forward to working with you and making this program run uh, uh, even better and more integrated than before. We've also had uh, budget decisions made by the uh, Silent Lab board and uh, uh, many of you have uh, seen what that outcome is all about but I just want to uh, tell you that there will be more funding to Silent Lab. We have not just budgeted that yet so don't don't be scared of yet that is this all that is available uh, in terms of budget. So stay tuned. We will make more uh, uh, funds available later on. Um, we also have something that we call the capability uh, of, uh, capabilities starting up. So this means that platforms should more and more work together uh, to develop capabilities that help scientists and they should uh, work together with the research community to promote this. And we will be talking a lot more about the capabilities in, in 2021. Uh, then maybe even though this is a totally national uh, broadcast and episode, I just want to highlight the Campus Solna that it's it's been a year when when uh, we started to address very uh, uh, actively a lot of things to make Campus Solna, which is where more than half of all SciLife Lab people work at the moment, to work it better. And I hope you have seen some developments there, even though we haven't really been able to, to work together in, in, in that uh, context. And, and the uh, Bert Ljungdal as a Campus Solna director has done a wonderful uh, job. So, so thanks for that. Uh, uh, finally, I mean, uh, one way that we actually, I think, have achieved a lot is that we get great advice from our international advisors. And uh, it's again the year 2021, something that we uh, welcome our international advisory board to come to SciLife Lab and give us uh, some guidance. And I actually look forward to talking them, talking to them and describing all of these wonderful developments that you've seen featured in this talk show episodes that, that lots of good things have happened at SciLab Lab and lots of good things are go going to happen at SciLab Lab. So this will be very exciting. So finally, I mean, uh, a big thanks to the, uh, to the production team at SciLab Lab for making this uh, possible. So this has really worked professionally and extremely enjoyable uh, sort of a presentations. Uh, Eric Erkstam, uh, David Gotthold and Karin Nedler at the operations office. Uh, then we have had uh, Mia Philipson and Johan Rung providing advice on the content. And then we've had a, 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 an editorial board kind of a, for this program. And you will, I'm not gonna read everybody's name but you will see them featured in the texts that are uh, popping up shortly. I also want to thank the distinguished guests that we have had appearing in this program. So we've had uh, uh, rectors uh, appearing, we've have had board members appearing, we've had the chair of the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation appearing in this program and not just being present, but they've been extraordinary positive to all of the things that have happened. And I think you should all be extremely proud of this support. It bodes well uh, for the future. And obviously, big thanks to all the SciLife labbers who have appeared in the program. Those of you who have been interviewed, those of you who have told us about your work, 
it's been really exciting to learn about it and i hope we can do these types of programs more in the future and and we'll learn uh, more about the details of the fantastic work that people people do and then finally i mean this is i mean let's not forget why we did this whole show this is a 10 year anniversary uh, 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 program for SciLife Lab. So I would uh, like to thank you all and wish uh, you and us and everybody a uh, happy birthday uh, for a 10 year old uh, SciLife Lab, which kind of a turns uh, into the teenage uh, years now. And, and let's see what we can uh, do together in, in, in that sense. And uh, since, since this is uh, uh, close to mid-December, it's also my pleasure to just uh, wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and enjoy the holidays despite of this uh, difficult season and maybe uh, inability to fully cele celebrate with the big community uh, and, and uh, look forward to seeing you next year and uh, look forward to working with you for the next decade of uh, SciLife Lab. So with that, thanks so much and see you later. Bye-bye.